Next up, we have a panel discussion on regulatory and legal landscape. Uh, for that, we have Peter Van Malkenberg, Catherine Wu, Caitlin Long, Lindsay Lin, and moderated by Bruce Fenton. Bruce, I'll let you take over. Great, thanks a lot. This is a great panel, some of the best experts in this space, and uh, regulation is for better or worse, completely tied in with this industry and everything that we do, so it's important even at a very technical conference to talk about this. We talked on the phone a few days ago and covered a lot of different topics. I'll kind of give a quick overview of some of the things that we talked about, and then we'll, we'll hit on a few of these points and try and open it for plenty of time for questions, because I think that's uh, the more questions from the audience, the better. But some of the, some of the broad topics that we discussed were you know, certainly all of the issues around securities and the SEC, uh, particularly bearer assets, some of the areas of existing law as well as how do we look at things in this new world where there are things that uh, either current law has never looked at or hasn't looked at for quite some time. Uh, we talked about uh, Bank Sec Secrecy Act, enforceability, and FinCEN. We talked a little bit about airdrops, peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading, how regulations work around that, uh, we talked a little bit about custody and how custody works in, in, in relation to regulations, things like uh, regulations requiring qualified custodians, how you hold money in this new world where we haven't thought about these kind of things for a while. Uh, we talked a little bit about the um, universal uh, laws, uh, model laws, Wyoming, some of the things Wyoming is, which, which a lot of people are aware of, and then internationally, how will all of this uh, ecosystem both securities and non-securities, how will it work in a, in a very international world? Crypto is very international, and uh, one of the beauties about it is that we can move m money or something of value from one person in one country to another. Uh, and that's kind of a big, broad overview. So it's, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting things going on around this. And uh, we'll try and cover some of those topics and then leave plenty of time for you to ask your own questions. So if you can be thinking about you know, quick questions that hopefully we can cover a lot of ground, I think that's a good, a good way to start. So um, maybe we could just start with Peter. Peter has talked, oh, the other topic that we didn't include on there, which is, which is one of the best ones, is privacy, um, <laughs> which Peter has, uh, w probably the perfect person to start. Peter's been doing a lot of work with Coin Center and has done some very interesting, I think it was a 72-page paper that he wrote the other day on, or, well, I don't suppose you wrote it the other day, but it was published the other All day. All in one day. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> I can write a fast paper, but it just doesn't turn out very good. <laughs> Peter has a much higher signal-to-noise ratio, so maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about what that paper is and what kind of things you think are important about privacy and how it relates to the Fourth Amendment. That sure. Kind of so, um, so briefly, um, Coin Center, wh what we try and do is, uh, we want to be, uh, 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 we were actually just talking about Game of Thrones, sort of the night's watch for crypto, sort of watchers on the wall looking ahead at what policy developments might be coming down the road in years um, ahead. We started working on some securities law issues back in 2014. This was like the Ethereum presale had happened and MasterCoin, but this was well before the ICO bubble. And we were really concerned, most fundamentally, that the SEC would confuse the distinction between a running network with something like Bitcoin on it and an ICO, which quite frankly often does look a lot like a security and maybe should be regulated for investor protection like a security. And so we published a paper back then about that topic. So fast forward, um, and we can talk about securities law later, I kind of like the policies at the SEC right now, actually. I think they could be further clarified and maybe codified in statutory law so that they can't be changed by future commissions. But from Coin Center's perspective, we've done most of the good work that we think we could actually manage to do on that issue. And now we're looking for that next thing. If ICO bubble and things like that was what happened in the last three years, what's going to happen in the next three years that we need to be worried about from a policy response standpoint? And from Coin Center's perspective, Jerry and I talk about this, and we keep coming back to the emergence of robustly private, permissionless blockchains. So Monero, Zcash, amazing presentation by Kathy just earlier this morning about the work that Stellar's doing with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, Grin, um, other Mimblewimble implementations, and the prospect that I think we've all been waiting for for a while that even Bitcoin, uh, whether it's through wallet software like Wasabi or whether it's through actual changes to the protocol, will deliver on the promise of electronic cash, i.e. transactions that don't leave a record. 
If that's what's coming in the next three years, there is going to be a massive decline in the amount of surveillable data related to cryptocurrency transactions. And that's a very good thing if you believe in human dignity and individual autonomy. <laughs> but if you're law enforcement, that can be threatening because you worry that you won't have the information you need to catch criminals and money launderers and things like this. Mm -hmm. So if that's what's next, then we need to start thinking about what the possible policy responses to that technical change might be. Perhaps an overzealous or overbroad attempt to surveil these networks through new laws or policies. Perhaps an attempt to apply the Bank Secrecy Act, which we mentioned we're going to discuss a little bit about, to people who aren't traditionally understood as financial institutions, but maybe even directly to software developers or to the users of the networks themselves to say, you're now technically a financial institution, which means you're deputized by the US government to collect information on your counterparties and report that information to government when it's suspicious. And so the two papers that we just released, uh, one a month ago that um, Coin Center's executive director, Jerry Brito, wrote, and one released now by me, they make two arguments. Jerry says, Electronic cash is important for human dignity and individual autonomy. It's increasingly important in a world where real physical cash, tangible cash, is, is, is disappearing. You look at Scandinavia, you look at China, everyone's making electronic payments now, either by card or in China by Alipay or WeChat Pay. And cash, physical cash, is this sort of safeguard that you won't be systematically cut off from the economic system by an intermediary who can completely surveil and control your transactions, like WeChat or Alipay. But if cash is going away, electronic cash is another way to preserve that freedom and that capability for people, especially people in potentially repressive surveillance states. So his paper makes that argument, I think, it makes it extremely well. And it's an argument that hasn't been made enough, especially outside of the cryptocurrency community. So we want to socialize that with people in government who might be sympathetic, even though people in government, you might think, have many interests to have these networks open. They also care about liberty. They also care about uh, stopping repressive surveillance states, some of them. Uh, my paper then says, OK, if we have a moral, ethical case for why electronic cash and anonymous cryptocurrency is important, we also need to understand the legal arguments for why any attempt to regulate the software developers of those networks, say people who develop zero-knowledge proof technology, people who develop the actual protocols, people who develop wallets, why they cannot be constitutionally regulated under things like the Bank Secrecy Act, why that would be effectively a warrantless search and seizure of data over which users of the network still retain a reasonable expectation of privacy. And if it's unconstitutional, it doesn't matter if Congress votes for a law that would actually put those kinds of surveillance regimes in place. You can't do it. You need to amend the Constitution to do it, which is something that requires a lot of political motivation, something that we rarely see in our history. And then we also make the argument that any attempt to compel the developers of this software to put back doors into their software, uh, or any attempt to ban the publication and distribution of software in the US if it accomplishes things like electronic cash systems would violate our First Amendment rights to freedom of speech. So that's 72 pages of case law from the last 50, 60 plus years, 250 footnotes. I think the constitutional arguments are very strong. You might say the government doesn't actually give a whatever about the Constitution. I've seen that on Twitter. Like I, I published this thing and they're like, well, they don't care about their own <laughs> laws. I'm like, well, if you're a nihilist, sure, then let's just you know go into the woods and enjoy anarchy. But, I think we can make strong arguments and be on the right side of the law and protect innovators. And that's what these papers are about. Great. Good stuff. So, Lindsay, maybe um, if you could talk a little bit about what your view is on sort of what do you think the, I mean, if, if you look at this conference, the first one, there was probably three lawyers in the entire industry. Now there's thousands and thousands. There's law firms, there's general counsels, there's just hundreds and hundreds. What is your view, do you think, that the, both the lawyers, the outside counsel, and the, and the general counsels of the various projects in this space, what, is the, what are the, the, the big issues on their mind that are keeping them awake at night? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as an intro, my name is Lindsay Lin, and I am a legal counsel at the Stellar Development Foundation and also Interstellar. And, you know, as an in-house counsel, I think 
most GCs and in-house counsel think about two major buckets of uh, legal issues. One is how existing laws and regulations apply to the technology we want to build and the applications that we want to uh, release. And the other is how does how do laws and regulations and policy need to change in order to actually uh, have the potential of the technology be unlocked? So for the former category, uh, what laws and regulations apply, obviously we think a lot about the SEC, we follow FCFTC, FinCEN, we follow state regulators, international regulators, we you know have a litany of uh, <laughs> regulatory bodies to uh, pay attention to. We also are following what's going on in Congress. Like last year, there was a Token Taxonomy Act. So we have to be on top of all these, um, you know, potential developments and also potential interpretations of existing guidance and laws. And on the latter category, um, so we actually think a lot about, you know, what part of our laws are going to be redundant in the face of blockchain technology. And I know Caitlin is working a lot on that in Wyoming, so I won't go too deep in that, but you know, I think that if we try to superimpose existing, existing regulations on blockchain technology, we'll end up with uh, something that looks like the existing financial system with a different database. Um, so we don't want that to happen and we want, uh, you know, even though current regulations, a lot of them purport to be technology agnostic, we want to make sure that the assumptions that they carry um, are not going to be impediments to the potential of blockchain technology. So these two categories of things, um, I think a lot of in-house counsel, all in-house counsel and in blockchain projects are thinking very hard about. <laughs> Cool, thanks. So, Caitlin, um, you may have been asked this about before, but uh, apparently you're doing something in Wyoming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> to continue Peter's Game of Thrones analogy, we can call you Lady Caitlin of House Wyoming. <laughs> What's going on, and uh, what can other states and other jurisdictions learn about uh, best practices about what we should be looking at in the law? Yeah, well, uh, uh, just to, to set the table, states control commercial and property laws in the United States. It's not the federal government. Um, the federal government, unfortunately, has supremacy with regard to securities. So if you can get out of the securities bucket, actually the states control the law. And what Wyoming did was pass 13 bills, five last year, eight this year, to welcome this industry with open arms, to do everything we can as a state to green light innovation and crypto across the board. So last year, Wyoming exempted all of this from its money transmitter law. So crypto to crypto, all transactions are exempt. Uh, Wyoming took, uh, clarified that there is no tax on crypto assets, none whatsoever. There's no income tax, there's no property tax, there's no sales tax. Um, and, and we were the first state to say that utility tokens are exempt from securities laws in the state. Of course, again, I said federal securities laws trump state, so, but this has actually started quite a movement now because we're up to seven states now that are either in the process of, that, are, that have already passed a, the Wyoming language on, the, on um, exempting utility tokens or are in the process of passing it. And the Token Taxonomy Act actually picked up from the Wyoming um, exemption, which Peter helped us draft a year ago. Um, and then this year we did stuff with, with even more teeth. Um, we, we did something really foundational, which is that we clarified that digital assets are property under commercial law. Um, and what that does is forestall what would potentially be a mess that lawyers had called Bitcoin's Achilles heel, which is that as people start pledging Bitcoin as collateral for loans, it's gonna cre start to create liens on Bitcoin, and there's no way to track those on the blockchain, and this is gonna be a mess. And the way that the liens get so-called perfected, which is how you create an enforceable lien, is you file a piece of paper with the Secretary of State. Um, and believe it or not, a lot of liens on Bitcoin probably do exist already in that form. Will they ever be enforceable? Who knows? But what Wyoming did was step forward and say, that makes no sense. 
let's clarify that it's property that can be directly owned by individuals, and we can facilitate peer-to-peer -peer lending of those assets, including by smart contracts, that's recognized as legal, um, and, and we mapped virtual currencies, including Bitcoin, to the same commercial laws that govern money. So in plain English, what that means is that you don't have to go search to verify that the person from whom you're buying the Bitcoin actually owned it outright. A technologist is scratching your head probably saying, why would I bother to think about that? But the reality is that, I like how Trace Mayer puts it, that technology has to be backwards compatible with the law. Um, and so ultimately what we did is make it backwards compatible with the law. So this is, this is essentially making it as negotiable as the US dollar. Nobody else has ever done that. And I will say this, we got, uh, we poked a few bears to get this done. We have a new special purpose depository institution that's gonna help bank the blockchain industry. We did a few things for the miners, uh, et, et cetera. We have a FinTech sandbox, so you know anything goes as long as you're not hurting consumers and you get pre-approval, you can do things that are exempt from financial regulation in the state of Wyoming. But the bears we poked are the banking industry, who, were, who are, um, I'm their public enemy number one, um, and um, the Uniform Law Commission, which is an establishment group that I'm gonna be blunt and say something that I didn't put in writing, um, that tried to attack Bitcoin. And the reason that they did it was they tried to force, through something called the Supplemental Act, tried to force this commercial law that I just went into that you probably, your eyes glaze over, they tried to force it into only recognizing what's called super negotiability of Bitcoin if they are owned through securities intermediaries. So what Wyoming did was say, we looked at that and said, that makes no sense. Most people own Bitcoin directly. We should give individual owners the same rights. You shouldn't have to go through an intermediary to get those rights. And so we rejected it, but they came with two letters to us midstream. Nobody in Wyoming could ever occur that this had ever, could ever recall that this had ever happened before. That the Uniform Law Commission asked a state to stop mid-process, its legislative process, and thanks to those amazing uh, good Wyoming cowboys, you know what they did? I actually think it ran up the vote count in favor of the Wyoming bill. They passed it um, 28 to one in the Senate right after that happened, and then 54 to two in the House. Um, and, and so, uh, but I do believe that was an attack on Bitcoin because if you think about what that would have done, it was a backdoor way to force everybody back into, as, as Lindsay said, that the old existing financial system, you only got true negotiability, you can only lend your Bitcoin if you go through a securities intermediary. How the hell did that make sense? Um, and so uh, Wyoming and Missouri now has um, uh, uh, introduced it. I hear South Carolina may also be in, this, in the process of introducing that. So the law can come up and bite everybody in the you know what, or it can actually open the doors and that's what we've, we've the latter is what we've done in Wyoming. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So Catherine, in, in light of, of what the other panelists have said and thinking about these broader issues, if, if you could, a lot of people always ask for clarity around this space. If you could sit down and have a magic wand that could clarify any aspect <laughs> of law <laughs> or, or change a law realistically, uh, what, would you, what would you do and why? Um, that's a good question. So I think there's one thing that I usually like to remind people of when they're like, we want more guidance and we want more definitions, like clearly, is that I remind them of the New York bid license because that <laughs> came early and that got defined early. And in fact, that got defined so early that it causes a lot of problems today for companies that are based in New York, right? Like the company that I worked at um, was based in New York. And, you know, like, the bid license came out, or the requirements came out in 2015, right? And they regulated sort of like all, or maybe earlier, but all virtual currency activities. And back then it was pretty much like Bitcoin. And now you have all these things that are built on top of like Ethereum and other sort of blockchains. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Does that kind of encompass all of that? So, so I always like try to use that as an example to say, okay, let's put some more thought behind this. And like what, you know, Caitlin, I think what you're doing is awesome because that's actually like sort of, you're having conversation within the industry and with actual legislators to actually put that out. And, and I think that's really awesome. Um, and I do think that it does have to at le some level start from the state 
um, because I think federal legislation obviously moves a lot slower. And from states, mm -hmm. if you know, like Wyoming starts, and now you know you see other states start, that's sort of how I think a movement starts, right? Because if you look at like crowdfunding, that's sort of also led by the state. And there's a lot of states that still don't have buy-in, like many, many states. I mean, you talk to sort of any state level regulators, and they're sort of like, oh, we're afraid to touch it, right? Um, but this also brings t uh, me to another like sort of a uh, tangential topic, which is like looking at the broader international community and, and international regulators and how they're thinking about these. Because so far we've all sort of talked about like on the US level, right? And when I was in, um, so I traveled to, to Asia a lot. Um, I, I grew up there and everything. And when you talk to regulators, for example, I sat down with the Hong Kong SFC, which is the Hong Kong version of the SEC plus CFTC. And their take on it is a lot different from uh, what I thought US regulators um, had on, right? Because um, from the onset, you know, I sat down with the Hong Kong SFC and I was like, how are you guys thinking about regulating these, you know, virtual cryptocurrency assets? And their first thing was, oh, well, we don't actually assume that these are securities off the bat, which to me, I was like, wait, what? Because <laughs> <laughs> all of what you hear, like, you know, in 2017, like the first time that I really heard the SEC put out any official statement, it was like, oh, I see those are securities, right? And you're like, okay, well, <laughs> that doesn't help. But yeah. other countries are thinking about it differently because right. they're seeing this as like, okay, like this is super important and we can see the future. And we don't want this sort of innovation to you know, be dominated once again by Silicon Valley or, or by the US. And so you see Hong Kong, you see Malaysia, you see Singapore. And you know, if you look at like the broader Asia market, that's like over a billion people, right? And that's a huge market to tackle. Mm -hmm. And so I think the open minded way that they're thinking about it is that look, like we don't think these things are securities because we've frankly never seen these things before and we're uncomfortable to all just loop it under our jurisdiction. And so the way, for example, the Hong Kong government is approaching it is, we are taking an opt-in, opt-out approach. And if you want to issue these things and you want to list these things, we're not your advisors to say, yeah, go ahead or not do it. You take that responsibility. And you tell us why you're not securities and ultimately you face those sanctions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I thought that was a much more sort of like healthy and friendly way to approach thinking around these things. And also, you know, there's been a lot of talk, at least in the US side, do we do a sandbox? Do we do a safe harbor? And Hong Kong already established a sandbox, mm -hmm. right? And all they said was, look, here's the requirements that you need. It's a 12 month tri trial period. If you can prove to us that in these 12 months that you can stop, so for example, if you're an exchange, you can prove to us that you've taken enough precautions to stop various sort of like market manipulation like practices, then after 12 months, like well, whatever, you don't need our blessing to do this. Um, so I sort of walked out of it and, and my first thought was, holy shit, why are more companies <laughs> sort of moving out of the US, right? Yeah. And that's obviously, I don't think that's what, you know, everyone, or at least like I came and watched like Hester speak yesterday. I think US regulators are aware of that. They're just scared to move. And but if you're hesitating too long and you're sort of like coming out with like rules or you're or you're hesitating too much on providing more clarity, people are going to leave out of frustration. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so we'll uh We'll open it for some questions uh, but while you're getting ready. So you can go ahead and, and grab one of these two mics. And um, I'll ask the first one now. I'll, um, I am a, I'm not a lawyer. You, 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 we have four of the top legal experts in this field. I have not been able to find many rules about bearer assets. They're just, especially stocks. There's some stuff, you know, when I started in the, in the, in the industry or my mom started in the industry, there was a couple bearer assets, but... I haven't really heard of anybody having a certificate that's worth anything for a long time. So it seems that we're now in this new world that's like the old world, and anybody can take this. What laws govern bearer assets? Is this sort of a new thing that nobody's thought about in 30 years, so we're kind of reinventing it? Or you know, what are the ramifications of having this thing that works very, very differently? I mean, for example, as an investment firm, we never, ever, ever worried about custody. I mean, I never, I mean we've handled billions of dollars, never, ever lost a minute's sleep worrying that somebody who's going to steal it. It's a whole different world uh, if, you're custo if you're doing custody. How, how will these kind of things work? When anybody can take this, and then we'll go ahead and start with some questions. In, in Wyoming, uh, Bruce, we, we, we looked at this. And what, uh, what, a couple of the other things we did, we, I, we authorized blockchain shares under Wyoming law. That, Delaware was the first to do that uh, a couple of years ago, but it was uncertificated shares. Uh, and so the ERC-884 standard didn't fit within what Delaware did. Um, so Wyoming copied Delaware last year, and then this year we went ahead and, and said, you don't need a paper stock certificate. Your certificate can be represented by the same information that's recorded on a blockchain. Um, now, that is, uh, actually, it, it, it's gonna be weird if it turns out that um, we're gonna go in the direction of regulated the, regulating these assets as 
um, bearer assets because state securities laws and state, more specifically state corporate laws, prohibit bearer securities. So uh, we're going to have, a, again, I think Wyoming's probably going to be on the forefront of this. There are all kinds of rumors that the SEC is going to come out with some guidance at some point. I have no clue. I mean, everyone's, you know, nobody's holding their breath. Um, but if they do, um, and they come out in the, in, in the, with the guidance that these are bearer assets, it's, we're going to have an interesting clash with state corporate law and that's gonna to have to be um, um, updated. But with regard to custody, um, one quick thing. Wyoming, because we have that uniform commercial code approach that recognizes direct property rights in digital assets, as opposed to forcing everybody, you can opt into, but you're not forced into that indirect ownership regime. This is really important because one of the things that flows from that is that you can have custody as what's called a bailment. That's a legal construct. It's one of the oldest legal constructs in the world, way outdates the United States existence. Um, and it's basically where I give you custody of an asset. I Sorry, I give you control of the asset, but I retain ownership of it. So what you have, what we set up is custodians that really don't custody assets, they just control the private key, but they're not permitted to act with that private key unless there is an explicit direction from the customer. That is a huge thing. You know the impact of this in securities because that doesn't exist in securities right now. So I, I think a giant sucking sound is gonna, be, is, is gonna be coming out of the state of Wyoming in the next few years because, um, as in sucking assets in from other states because you're actually going to actually have directly um, um, a direct ownership of the assets under custody. And a bailment is kind of like valet parking. You give up um, possession of your car, but but not ownership of it. And if you structure it right in the right layers of trusts and things like that, you can do some very, very, very clever things to make it pretty difficult, uh, really, really, really difficult for somebody to get your, your, so, your money. Just briefly on the bearer assets aspect. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've struggled with this for a while myself, at least with respect to um, proper cryptocurrencies that don't represent a claim on anyone. Like, if I have a private key that controls a certain number of unspent transaction outputs on the blockchain, I don't have legal rights against anyone else. I have some physical capability in the world that actually allows me to prove to others that I have something of value and to give it to others. Now, a bearer asset is something along the lines of you have some sort of certificate that says pay to bearer, and you can take that to the person who will honor that. I don't need anybody to honor my private keys for my Bitcoin. The network will do it. It's not really a bearer asset if it's really pure crypto. It's a commodity, like a lump of gold that happens to yeah. go through the internet. And so maybe this is one way, and I'm just thinking of this on the, on the panel today, I haven't thought of a lot, of avoiding some of the issues, and there are a lot of issues that surround the regulation of bearer assets, because historically they have been used for a lot of nasty things. I think in Die Hard, the, the plot's <laughs> mostly about like uh, <laughs> stealing bearer bonds. OPSEC, don't give away any ideas. There's, 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 there's some people in this audience who may have Bitcoin. <laughs> yippee i ki -yay, Bitcoin. Let's go ahead and take some, qu we'll start with some sure. questions. And we'll try and keep the questions short sure, and yeah. the answers as short as we can so we can cover as many so as possible. Question go ahead. Question for Peter. Uh, export uh, munitions regulations from 1992. That's right. So, crypto so, wars. Yeah, so I was uh, leading the Kerberos development team at MIT. We were asked to implement a particular Japanese cipher mm -hmm. uh, that shall remain nameless because the Japanese government and the companies there use our open source code extensively. We finished it and we got advice from our beloved general counsel office not to include the cipher implementation in the Kerberos package itself. So uh, instead of uh, uh, putting a ban on software engineers in developing code, wouldn't it be easier for the US government to say, hey, we are henceforth classifying particular ciphers, you know, elliptic curve of a particular parameter, a particular key length as a munition. munition. Yep. And you guys can work on you know, the short, sort of weak crypto and keys, but, but wouldn't that be easier for them? So um, is this on? OK, it's back on. So the question is about classifying it as munition and therefore finding a way to actually restrict its widespread dissemination. And this happened, uh, as you were saying. This is a, a big part of the crypto wars in the 1990s, and there's case law about this. It's uh, unfortunately a mixed bag of case law, and we go through these cases in this report that we just published. Um, the case that's, I think, the best is a lower court opinion 
uh, in, in the Bernstein versus Department of Justice case. And this was about ITAR and munitions. And Bernstein was a cryptographer, and he uh, wanted to publish uh, Snuffle, I think was the name of the algorithm. And it, was, uh, it had to go through this ITAR licensing process, and he would be banned from publishing it without getting approval, which they, in their complete discretion, could deny. So this, it, that is a ban. And, and the lower court in that case, now, problem, that case was vacated by the higher court. That decision was vacated. And there was a rehearing on bank, and then the government backed away. You know, like, we don't actually want to continue fighting this. That lower court opinion's been vacated, so we're left with a little bit of confusion as to what the state of the law is, and the government doesn't want to force the issue because they don't want to lose. So that's why we still have that confusion to this day. But the lower court opinion said, no. A, a licensing regime at the discretion of the regulator to classify things as munition is a prior restraint on speech. It's effectively a ban. It faces strict scrutiny review which means the government has to prove a compelling interest that could not be achieved through any less restrictive policy. And technically, I mean, uh, 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 in practice, you face strict scrutiny review for your law, it's found unconstitutional. So the judge found it unconstitutional. However, opinion vacated, uh, uh, intermission, wait until this comes up again in another, another court case. There's two other court cases, no, three other, Karn, um, uh, oh shoot, it's all flown out of my head right now. But there's two other, or three other lower court opinions where the judge made a mistake, I think, and analyzed these um, cryptographic software um, pieces not as speech, but as expressive conduct. Expressive conduct is traditionally understood in the First Amendment case law like flag burning and nude dancing. And how that's anything like software, I can't tell you. But if you're doing <laughs> expressive conduct, you're, the government is allowed to regulate you more than if all you're doing is speech. And that makes sense, because if you light yourself on fire, you're presenting a risk to other people around you. If you crash a plane into a building, you might be expressing a viewpoint, but you bet you're gonna be liable for doing that thing because we have law and order in the country. And so there's this mistake in this other case on the lower courts. Final thing, I know I'm like rambling a lot about constitutional law. The Supreme Court has never held on this stuff, except with respect to data about prescribed, uh, prescribed medications. It said that data is speech. It's not conduct, it's fully protected, even when prescription drug companies are buying and selling it for advertisement purposes. Protected speech. Data. That, 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 that's, that's everything. So the Supreme Court's actually got a super broad test for what is protected speech, and so I'm not too worried about the lower court opinions. Uh, yeah. So go ahead and make your forks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Thank you. My question is also for Peter. So um, I agree with you that uh, unsurveillable cash can become a boon to individual liberty and human rights. But then we also have to recognize that that creates a haven for criminals all the way up from you know, low level things like fraud and, uh, and like organ trafficking to human trafficking and arms dealing. So how do we reconcile this balance of individual liberty versus security? What are some moral findings that you found at the edge of this 72 page paper uh, that you would advise us for? Um, so most of the moral stuff's in Jerry's paper, which he published a month earlier. I, I recommend you read it. I think it's, it's excellent. And in that paper, we're just making the case that, look, these tools need to exist. Do they need to always be used? Not necessarily, but they need to be allowed to exist because without them, we're headed towards a much different world. It's not as if cryptocurrency is a departure from the norm. The whole last 50 years has been a massive departure from the norm, wherein people no longer interact directly with each other, they interact through a third party, and that third party is a surveillance party and a control party. And so that's the change. And we had law and order before that. And you might say, well, we can only maintain law and order if we keep the intermediaries. And I'd say, well, then how did the 1800s work, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I'm rambling, and I've already talked too much on this panel. Uh, the, the paper's excellent, I think. Giving my unbiased opinion <laughs> that Jerry and Peter's papers are definitely worth reading. Um, I might be the least technical person in the room, but I am uh, embedded in the healthcare system and just wondering um, this idea of kind of undoing antiquated laws that get in the way of innovation as well as solving important problems. Um, just wondering from a legal standpoint or just how the application in this space to the financial industry might start to make its way into other places like healthcare for solving you know, big problems where, for instance, there's a 50-year-old law that insurers can't share information about someone driving up 95, stopping at every pharmacy, 
picking up opioids with a provider to help solve that addiction problem. It's more punitive and it waits to get to, so I'm, there's a very similar overlap here of, of problems we're dealing with in healthcare that I'm just wondering if there's an application you see coming out sooner than later. Yes, definitely. Insurance is state law. So here's, again, where the states can have a big impact. We didn't have much bubble up from the Wyoming Blockchain Task Force on healthcare, but we have another year on the Wyoming Blockchain Task Force. So can I ask you to reach out to me with the idea? Because the states actually can uh, provide relief on things like that. And uh, w with that in mind, we will be having our next open meeting, Blockchain Task Force meeting. Um, it'll be in the second half of May in Jackson Hole. Uh, everybody's invited to that. We'll probably do some sort of a dog and pony show about moving to Wyoming as well. But it's an, o it's an, open, uh, it's an open task force meeting and we are actually, I mean, the, the ideas that we, that we um, got enacted into law, they didn't all come from me. They came from the industry funneling them through me. So um, send me your ideas. Awesome. I do want to add a point, um, which is that um, I feel like there's a lot of sentiment that's like, oh, let's do it with all laws that, apl that could apply to this and like rewrite all new ones. And I don't think that's the totally right way to think about it because like there are certain like crypto exchanges that are very centralized, right? And like I think not all, again, like I think there are some maybe like some companies that look at the laws that exist currently that actually do apply to them and are like, oh, we don't like this, so we're just gonna say it doesn't apply to us. But look, like stuff like front running or insider trading have been along or have been in existence for ages now. And there are laws that very specifically sort of like uh, punish those, right? And I think that's fine. I think the question is more like, okay, where do the laws need to change where it applies or, or not change or sort of even not apply when it comes to harder things like decentralized exchanges, right? But like where it is centralized and, and you know, like where there are clear securities fraud, like I don't think there's any need to sort of do away with those court of laws. Right. It's really thinking about specifically what is very new and creative about the problems that we're solving here that should be sort of treated differently. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, an anarchist, but I, I've also been in the securities <laughs> industry a long time. And I looked through these laws, 33 Act, 34 Act, 40 Act, they're as far as laws go, they're pretty good laws. There are a lot of stuff about about private property rights. I mean, if you if 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 I if if, if I give you a million dollars for ten percent of your company and you sell it to Microsoft tomorrow for a billion dollars, you can't say, "Oh, sorry, I diluted you. You get nothing." That wouldn't be fair. And there, some of these laws are are good. Um, some of them do need to be updated. So this might apply to all of you, but probably most directly to Catherine and Lindsay. Um, so I know at Masara you guys are trying to work on uh, self-regulation, um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that from like a third-party perspective, and maybe if you wanted to talk about that from like somebody who is inside of a crypto company. Uh, how does self-regulation look? Wh how would that work with the current regulatory framework and and that area of things? Yeah, well, so the self-regulatory thing, I think, comes from what I said earlier, which is that it's important to have conversations two ways. And especially in 2017, early last year, when Masari was founded, it was like, there are so many terms that we use in this industry that is... Um, that we're not even in, in, in sort of agreement on. So how do we expect people who are trying to like understand us and like maybe apply laws to us to figure it out? And so that's where the self-regulation thing comes from, which is that like, all right, so maybe for like traditional public companies there are certain like disclosures that you need to make, but when it comes to like a token, like an ICO or, or whatever, that's totally different. And so it's like, all right, how do we as an industry first standardize how we talk? Like I remember being at a round table and we had like a three hour debate over what an investor in like a token company means and you can make an argument for you know people who buy in on like their tokens but you can you may, maybe you can even make that argument for like miners right so it's like that even today I think warrants sort of arguments back and forth so that's where I think as an industry um, and for those of you who do us who work in the industry is important to come together and be like all right guys like this is what we mean when we say that or like here are the standards that we think make sense and that's also why Masari pushes so much of the transparency around like token supply right because that's sort of one thing that's super murky um, in this industry specifically. Cool. Two, two more questions. Oh, I think Lindsay has the one to answer that one. Um, yeah, so at Stellar, we think a lot about what is the ultimate purpose of a certain law or regulation. Is it to protect investors? Is it to promote more transparency, ensure like fairness, uh, access to, you know, equal access to orderly markets? We think a lot about the ultimate purpose of this. And currently, there are some laws that were 
not 100% certain whether or not it would apply to us, but internally we adopt standards that we think um, would further these uh, regulatory principles about you know, making sure no one gets a chance to trade on material non-public insider information um, or making sure that you know, the bots that we create uh, don't really don't have a huge like bad impact on the market. And so these things are things that we do think about a lot and we adopt voluntary restrictions on our employees, officers, directors, and our on our internal operations to make sure that you know even though the word of the law might not necessarily apply to us, we still uh, <laughs> do the right thing. Go ahead. Uh, so like all the panelists kind of touched on like how laws both exist to protect people, but then um, incumbents can use them to kind of fortify regulatory modes of sorts. So aside from like settlement finality in the context of like capital markets and like how um, traditional payments like Visa and MasterCard, they're like pool payments, can, can, uh, and would you juxtapose that with crypto? So then there's like not really like a an ability to charge back, so then there's kind of a consumer protection angle. Like aside from those two issues, like what other future issues do you think incumbents and special interest groups will try to like stop permissionless like uh, DLTs from functioning in? Well, I think we just we just saw that attempt um, with the Uniform Law Commission trying to pigeonhole all virtual currencies into intermediaries in order to gain what's called super negotiability, which is the optimal treatment under commercial law. And by the way, that attempt is is active. It's that that law's been introduced in California, Nevada, Oklahoma, and Hawaii. So if you live in any of those states, um, you know what I've observed from the regulatory from from the legislative process is legislators don't want to enact things that are controversial. So you can you know at a grassroots level create enough doubt in the legislators' minds. By all means, it is worth your time if you live in those states to reach out and say, don't pass these laws. Um, um, so, hey, but can I yeah. Um, so, Coin Center uh, supported the Uniform Law Commission in its first model act, which was uh, just an alternative to the bit license. As, as we were saying earlier, the bit license was really quite horribly drafted to be overbroad. And Coin Center worked with the ULC to create an alternative for states that were going to license this activity anyway. Like, that's, that was a foregone conclusion. The legislator wanted consumer protections to apply to a Coinbase or a Kraken or what have you that would make sure in the Uniform Law Commissions Act that the license would only be required for companies that actually hold other people's bitcoins. Not all these vague other persons that might be regulated by the bit license, like say a node on the Lightning Network or a full node operator or a miner. And so our objective is always just to protect the base layer infrastructure of these networks from regulation. So to us, the ULC bill, while sure it required licensing from intermediaries like Coinbase, at least unlike the bit license, it clearly exempted from a licensing requirement individuals who were not holding other people's bitcoins. Even individuals participating in a two of, uh, a two, of two multi-sig with an N-lock wouldn't qualify under the ULC's definition of who needs a license. Now, the next thing the ULC did here was pass the Supplemental Act, That's which the problem. is yeah. the part that tells exchanges that are licensed how they hold assets for their customers as securities entitlements and Coin Center never took a position on that part. But I will say that if a state is going to pass a licensing act, better that it passes the ULC's first act without the supplement. Exactly. And yeah. not the bit license. And not necessarily leave their existing money transmission license in place either, because those laws are extremely broadly drafted. Um, Wyoming doesn't have this issue because you guys just exempted from money transmission any purely crypto activity, which I think is another very pro-innovation policy. But there are going to be states like California where I don't imagine them saying, we're not going to license exchanges. I think they're going to want to license exchanges. And in that case, I still think the ULC's original model act, maybe without the supplement, is, is the right approach. Yeah, th th that's... It's, it's nuanced, though. Yeah, it is nuanced. That's the problem. What happened is the Uniform Law Commission appended this supplemental act to the original act that Coin right. Center supported, but Coin Center doesn't sound like you guys were involved with that supplemental act. No. Rhode Island did it smartly. They just introduced the original act without the supplemental act. The four states that I laid out in introduced both together, oh. which means basically you're stuck with the supplemental act if you're in California and the bill passes. Um, which means then they don't direct, they don't um, um, 
respect direct property rights and direct ownership in digital assets. Um, that's not to say that someday they might not go back and reopen it, but what do you think the chances are that they go back and reopen it? It's pretty much zero. So once it's done, it's, it's done, and I think you're gonna see a mass exodus of companies out of California, and frankly, Bitcoin owners out of California too. And I, I hate to, because uh, I'm gonna cross Wyoming a little, but um, Catherine was talking about uh, federal preemption. Ultimately, the state licensing thing is ridiculous. It's ridiculous even if you're PayPal, that you'd have to get a license in 53 states and territories where you might have customers. You're a global business. You should have at least one US regulator, not 53 independent regulators, even if some of them are really cool like Wyoming. If we could get the <laughs> Wyoming laws passed at the federal level and preempt yeah. the other states, we're then it. we're really talking about, I don't, yeah. I don't know. So, Federal preemption still might be on the table. We wrote a, a report uh, a year and a half ago about why state money transmission licensing makes no sense in a world with the internet and internet payment intermediaries. And I still think that's the right approach. It's just hard to get Congress to do something like that. But to answer your question, they're just not gonna give up the, the um, regulatory reins. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, there are some states like, like the, the Rocky Mountain states it's not an accident that Colorado's following in Wyoming's footsteps, and there's a, it's bubbling up in Utah, too. Montana doesn't even have a money transmitter, um, money transmitter act. I think you're actually going to see an arc of crypto-friendly states, and, and you know, it, we're going to start to see a migration out of the coastal, heavy-handed regulation states into that arc of Rocky Mountain states that take a friendly approach to this industry. Cool. One final question, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, so I think one of the most interesting parts of the uh, continued evolution of the cryptocurrency space is kind of in the privacy area, since that's kind of one of these fundamental human rights that uh, hasn't quite reached mainstream adoption. I've, I've noticed that the U.S. has kind of fallen uh, drastically behind that, uh, whether it's a manifestation uh, through the lack of liquidity in OTC markets for currencies like Dash, which have had uh, a very uh, amazing um, adoption in, in places like South America, where you can't trust the government, that kind of thing. And uh, you know that's kind of been stifling the evolution and the ability for the for people to participate in those. You know, especially ones that are not you know engaging in nefarious activities, but believe it's kind of a human right. Um, how do you see the the regulation around the KYC AML um, policies in the U.S. evolve to perhaps involve uh, be a little bit more accommodative towards privacy coins? Since obviously, like U.S. cash, you know, there's statistics out there about you know how much cocaine is on different hundred dollar bills or whatever it is. Um, it, you know, you could make a similar kind of argument for these privacy cryptocurrencies. So what, where, where do you guys stand on that and where do you see it going? So, uh, to my mind, there's no uh, part of the BSA that says that a BSA regulated entity can't deal in anonymous cryptocurrencies. Not in the black letter law, not at all. Um, in fact, we saw in New York State, uh, the DFS, for all its faults with the bit license, decided to allow the uh, Gemini to trade Zcash, and even to interact with the Zcash network using shielded addresses, which is kind of remarkable. A lot of people think that they're only allowed to use transparent addresses. They're allowed to use the shielded addresses. And a lot of this has to do with, I, I think, I, I wish I could take credit for it, but a lot of it has to do with Zuko uh, going to New York and just talking with regulators in his goofy Zuko kind of way, if you know Zuko. <laughs> and he's disarming, and he's honest, and he cares about it as a human right, and regulators, quite often, usually, are people too. They're not all lizards. <laughs> and some of them care about privacy. They really do. And I think he managed to convince them that, look, people in New York State are going to use Zcash no matter what. Um, they're going to get it from unregulated exchanges overseas where they could be Mt. Goxed. Why not let them get it from a New York State trust company? And why not also celebrate that and question why everyone doesn't use these tools, which protect the privacy of the customers of financial institutions far better than fully transparent cryptocurrencies and far better than the legacy financial system. And I think it was a winning argument for him. Can he repeat that in other states? I sure hope so. Like, go Zuko, go. Like, both for, for Zcash's sake, which, uh, full disclosure, I'm a member of the foundation board, but also for Monero, which I do love, uh, uh, for Mimblewimble and its, its incarnations like, like Beam and, and Grin, like, this is the technology that protects consumers and protects privacy. Regulators should like it. It's a hard sell, but they should. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot to this great panel. Exciting times ahead. We're pushing the limit as the guards on the wall, figuring out what we're allowed to do in this world. Isn't that cool? Freedom. 
Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>